pests. They destroy your plants. Eat your crop. And the blooms off your flowers. So how do you manage them? Well, hello everyone. If you are new here, my name is Chantel. I garden in zone 5B, 6A. We live in New Hampshire and we live on a two acre lot. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to manage pests and diseases in your garden by showing you how I do it in our garden over here. This right here is my arsenal. And although it looks intimidating at first glance, we will talk about every single thing one step at a time. So you don't have to be worried about having this many pesticides. You can start with something very small like this one right here. This is neem oil. This is an organic method used to combat pests and diseases. Neem oil is great for so many different pests. It's good for aphids, for um, I've used it on also squash bugs and I have noticed that it is the best to uh, combat squash bugs. I have also used DT or diatomaceous earth on squash bugs but we live in a very humid environment. It rains most of the time and um, most of the DT needs to be dry when applied on insects that have an exoskeleton like the squash bugs. Now so there are certain DTs that do work under uh, wet environments and I have read a research paper on that and if I can find it again I will share it with you uh, but not all DT is made the same and this is why I prefer to go with the neem oil uh, because at least I know that it's going to work in a, in a wet environment as well. This works on also caterpillars and all sorts of insects. It's a great uh, one to have if you're just starting out and it can carry you on um, all season long. You only need a little bit, so you need one ounce per one gallon of water. And if you don't have a large garden, you can put it in a little spritzer bottle and use that. And I have this jar right here labeled with neem oil on it. And I use this to measure uh, how many ounces I need. And I have two different spritzers over here. There's this one right here. This is for deer repellent solely. And I do not recommend anyone to get this one because it is not good. I do not like it, but I have it and I'm using it. I also have this one here. This is from Chapin and I love this one. This is a backpack sprayer. It holds four gallons of water uh, in there. I like to add in uh, whatever application I'm using in at first and then I add in the water. This allows it to mix in and this is solely for organic insecticides and fungicides. I don't use it for anything else. You don't want to use the same sprayer that you use for herbicides to use it also for fungicides and insecticides. Uh, you have to separate those sprayers. You have to do have two different sprayers. I have three different sprayers. I have one for uh, the deer repellent because I don't want to spray that on our food. It stinks and I don't believe it is good to be ingested because I think it has some dog urine or coyote urine or something like that in there as well and rotten eggs and garlic and all the really nice beautiful stuff but you know deer is also one of those pests when we are talking about pests this is what deer damage looks like they will chew on the branches and strip them from their leaves as well and you'll see your branches are kind of broken at the end if i can get the camera to focus you could see right there how they chew it off and it just it doesn't look like a clean cut and you see this branch right here is all stripped mostly from its leaves and this also is deer damage now it has put on a little more leaves since i last saw it because i have been spraying it but if you do not spray it, the deer will get to it and they will eat it. <laughs> and here's a better example right here. So since we are talking about that, this right here is the deer repellent that I use. There are two different deer repellents actually. This one, let me put this down. This deer repellent here is called Bob X and it works great. Even after it rains, I have noticed that it still performs really well and I can go three weeks without spraying. The third week, you might start noticing deer starting to chew on your plants, but uh, if you, especially if you live in a humid environment like we do, uh, but this is great, even again, even after it rains. And also same with um, this one right here, Repelzol. This is from 
Bonide. A lot of actually what I use over here is from Bonide. It's all organic. There's nothing that is not organic. Uh, but things like uh, animal repellents, you don't want to use on plants that you are ingesting or in the ground where you have plants that you are ingesting. And they say that specifically on the label. So you have to read your labels and make sure that you are using it properly because you don't want to put something that can possibly harm you on the plants that you're going to be eating. So this right here is Repelzol. It works great on deer, rabbits, all sorts of things. Uh, but I have another problem that I've been battling with in the vegetable garden and that is voles and mice and um, I think rats as well. I may have rabbits. I don't know. I really have. I, I really hope that I do not have rabbits. But I've been trying something else recently and this is called Mole Max. I've tried it a few week, a few days ago and I have seen a little bit of improvement so far. Uh, I've So we have some animals that are coming and eating our crops just as I have showed you earlier in the video like tomatoes and such and this you don't again you don't want to uh, use the Mole Max inside your vegetable beds but you can use it on the perimeter of the garden so we have landscaping fabric around the perimeter of the beds to keep the weeds down um, and it doesn't work all the time but anyways <laughs> uh, so i sp i sprinkled this it's just granules it's like granule thing like so and you sprinkle that around your vegetable garden not in it so i sprinkled that around my tomato bed because that was being devoured and i have seen a lot less activity in there if any and also i have sprinkled it around most of the vegetable garden and the air and in the beds that i uh, that i see problems with and so far it looks like it's acting better uh, for when it comes to voles, moles, chipmunks, all those kind of things, which we have all of them in the repels all. Repels all is great for the larger animals I've noticed, but the little ones don't seem to really care about it. I don't know. At least that's what I have noticed. Earlier in the season, um, you might notice a lot of slugs. Like in the spring season, I had plants that were completely ridden with slugs like my grasses and some other plants of my hydrangea they were totally covered with slugs so i use this thing right here this is called slug magic it's also organic it's from bonite and i just sprinkled it around the base of the plant i also sprinkled it on on the plant itself because they were all over it and what happens is the slugs will eat this stuff basically once they ingest it it will just destroy their system and they die and this works great i don't have to really mess with them or pick them because they're gross and i don't want to yeah. <laughs> okay anyway so uh, those are the animal repellents and those are all granules by the way just as i've showed you with the mole max and they can last up to a month i think or more uh, i'm not sure with the slug slug magic how long it lasts but i have seen immediate improvement once i have used it and all the slugs were gone basically so now let's talk about all sorts of caterpillars and worms that you do not want in your garden so this right here is called caterpillar and webworm control. The main active ingredient in this one is Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis. if I'm saying that correctly, which is an organic uh, bacteria that is found in the soil. So they take that and then they put it in this as a concentrate. That is the main active ingredient. I don't know what else they put in there, uh, but it's organic. And I use this on all sorts of things especially like brassicas because you know the moth worms the moth uh, the cabbage moths they love those things and um, they will 
completely and utterly destroy them in a matter of a few weeks if you do not stay on top of them. So for things like brassicas, I spray them once a week if I have a lot of active moths in the garden. And if I don't, then I would spray them once every other week. This is what white fly damage looks like. And this thing was riddled with white flies and I did not know that until it was too late. But I have been spraying it every single week and I've seen so much improvement. Now it looks like it's dying, but it is not. This is what happens if you wait too long to spray or to inspect. So you want to inspect and if you know something that is susceptible to insect and uh, damage and to also fungal damage, uh, fungal diseases, then you want to actually do a preventative because of this. Uh, grape vines especially because they are in pots right here are very very susceptible to pests and to diseases so actually doing a preventative is going to save you some trouble and heartache now this one right here did not have as much damage on it and i started spraying it as a preventative once i saw the damage on that grapevine over there and i have seen so much improvement on it and its health because they were just starting out on it and now you can see that the leaves look so much healthier now it looks a little bit yellow because we have been getting a lot of rain and i gave it some fertilizer yesterday and i will be fertilizing it every week once a week just so that it can bounce back from all the wash that it has received from the rain and i do have to give it fertilizer once a week anyways because i also have these flowers right there and they do need the fertilizer and if you want to keep your petunias blooming you do have to spray them with bt or bacillus thuringiensis or uh, the one that i have showed you which is basically which basically has the active ingredient the um, caterpillar and hornworm something um, killer I forgot the name <laughs> but you get what I'm saying the same with the sweet alyssum the, the budworms also go for it as well if you want to keep it looking good and blooming uh, you do have to spray it because it is in the same family as brassicas but if you have a large uh, pest problem, this is what you're going to use. I have also used this on white flies, thrip, aphids, all sorts of things. And I also use it to spray on our trees because trees can get attacked with those things as well. I had white flies on our almond tree and on our apple tree. One of the apple trees that I have in the pot is a columnar apple. I've also had cutworms on our, one of our plum trees. And I think it was, I'm not sure if it was aphids or cutworms, but I have found eggs on my, our apricot tree. So that's another thing that you want to consider when you are looking at your, at your when you're walking in your garden and uh, you're taking care of your plants, uh, you want to kind of look at their leaves to see if there are any pests. If you see, if you notice a little bit of damage, uh, then you might want to check the tree for pests. Uh, or for disease as well and uh, you want to uh, see if there are any eggs in there if there are just pluck those leaves off because you will save yourself so much trouble because they lay hundreds and thousands of eggs and you will find one leaf covered completely with eggs so just do yourself a favor and just kind of overlook your plants and see what they have on them and take those leaves and crush those little eggs and toss them in the trash because you don't want those to propagate and even after you do that you still want to apply uh, the spray both neem oil and this this one work really great so what i do is i actually do one week with neem oil another week with bt and that is because you don't want those pests to get resistance to the or pesticide that you are using also, Bt is great for some fungal diseases like black, black spot, powdery mildew, um, all sorts of fungal diseases. It, it works really great on them. I have sprayed it on some plants that I have seen powdery mildew on and it seemed to help them a lot. Flax is one of those plants that does 
bottle powdery mildew and i don't know why i haven't thought of actually spraying it as a uh, with a preventative measure uh, as a preventative measure to prevent the powdery mildew on it this is the first time this is occurring to me i don't know why because i've never sprayed it before but this is something if, uh, if you have flocks this is definitely something that you're going to want to to stay on top of if you live in a humid environment especially because flocks is prone to powdery mildew and you can see how the roses they look super healthy because i have been spraying them uh, every once every two weeks as a preventative measure to keep them healthy and happy and if i do not spray them when i skipped a few weeks earlier in the season this is what they will look like and even worse if i can find one that's even more lacy i mean look what the bugs do to them if you just leave them alone this is what happens and if, especially if you live in a humid environment you're going to have black spot and i have battled black spot and uh, before and other diseases on my roses uh, these are this is their first season here but because i have uh, stayed very consistent on them with the spraying you can see they're super healthy because roses are very very susceptible to pests and diseases and they are doing so well And this nectarine tree over here is another tree that I was forgetting to spray as a preventative throughout the season. And earlier in the season, I noticed that I need to do it because it got this peach uh, curl, peach leaf curl on it. But as you can see, once I started spraying it, it has gotten so much healthier. Now, there were some pests that were attacking it. It looks, it looks like also a little bit of frost because of all the rain but this is why i really recommend to stay on top of your trees and continue to spray them every couple of weeks as a preventative if you notice a problem spray them every week and again one week use one thing the other week use another thing so that those pests do not develop resistance to what you are spraying your trees with or plants so that's another application to use neem oil with. This is why I'm saying when you want to start out first, do this one right here. And if you have deer, because this just this is so great. It works for so, so many things. And if you have deer, do this one. If you have more than deer, the bob the, the bob X right here. If you have it does work also on other animals, but if you are Kind of want to sprinkle it around the perimeter of your garden if you have edible plants i would recommend using the repelzol so you can do neem oil and repelzol when you are first starting when you're first starting out and those could be your two things that you use in your garden they work on both edible and ornamental plants so you don't need all the things that i have over here you can use these two things only but you want to keep on applying them uh, as a pre preventative even if you don't see any damage yet because um, sometimes those insects you might have one or two in there and then they just start laying eggs and they multiply like crazy their life cycle is so so fast and if you live in a humid environment then you want to combat things like powdery mildew and black spots and rust all these things uh, then you might want to apply that. I used to not spray at all and I thought that was a good thing. That was so wrong because I would not spray and then the um, insect population would just multiply so fast and then it would they would hibernate in the soil of course for the next season and the next season I would have even more. So you do have to combat those things whether you are using organic pesticides and insect, uh, insecticides or whether you are using something that's even more natural like releasing uh, bugs that are beneficial insects those are two different things that you could do you could, do, you could also release beneficial insects like the uh, lady uh, ladybugs you could purchase those and um, release them in your garden those will eat aphids but if you don't have aphids they will just 
leave and find somewhere else to feed on aphids. Uh, so, and also they're not as quick to uh, to minimize the population of your insects if you have a really large insect population. If you do have a really large insect population, you want to use something like the neem oil here and the Bt uh, to battle those because you want to reduce at least the insect population uh, because I don't believe that the, those in, those beneficial insects alone would be able to um, eat all the, the pests if you have too many. And if you do want to release beneficial insects, you don't want to apply any of the spray because you might harm them. And that's another thing that I want to talk about and is that when do you use the beneficial um, and when do you use the uh, not beneficial insects? When do you use uh, these things, the, the insecticides and, pes and pesticides? Uh, you want to spray these things early in the morning uh, before the pollinators are out because these can also harm the pollinators, and even though they are organic. So you want to be responsible and you want to spray them early in the morning, at dawn, or at dusk, late in the um, earlier in the evening when the sun is just starting to go down uh, when the bees and all the different pollinators are back to their homes uh, you want to spray at those times because you don't want to harm the pollinators because they help us they pollinate our crops and they pollinate our flowers and all sorts of things and they're good for the garden right it is important to note that if you do have a pollinator garden while the sprays are very helpful, it's probably not a good idea to spray them on your pollinator garden. I am right now in front of my pollinator garden, or what I like to call my butterfly garden. And if you do spray things like neem oil and Bt and fungicides, you will be actually killing your pollinators, especially if you have plants for them to lay their eggs on. You don't want to kill those caterpillars because you're trying to foster that relationship and you are trying to grow them. <laughs> and you want them to develop into the butterflies. But there are things that you can do to manage those pests and diseases, uh, like releasing the beneficial insects, which we have talked about, uh, that will target specific, uh, specific pests, uh, like the aphids, for example, or spider mites or whatever it is. You can choose specific beneficial insects for specific pests. So you don't have, you should not spray at all in, in these types of gardens. And you can also prevent diseases by choosing the right plants. For example, this plant right here is a black-eyed Susan. And what I have noticed in our environment is that black-eyed Susans get powdery mildew every single year. And if I do not want to spray the fungicides over here or the pesticides, then I have to choose plants that are resilient. So this right here, even though it's a great plant for the pollinators, especially the black swallowtails and, and the black cloak butterfly, it is not a good idea to have it in the butterfly garden because of our environment and it just cannot handle it. If you look at it, it looks kind of not, it, it does not look healthy. And I had to pull out some of the black eyed Susans that were here already because of the powdery mildew that they get. But instead, I will choose a different plant that will also attract pollinators, but will be healthier. Like for, like for example, I'm considering replacing the black-eyed Susans with this Coreopsis right here. This is Coreopsis lanceolata. It looks super lush, it's healthy, it's tall, it definitely, definitely needs to go to the back, back of the border over here. And I will be replacing the black-eyed Susans with this flower right here. I'll also probably have to do some research to see what type of flowers are good for those butterflies that I just spoke about so that I can plant the, some varieties of flowers that are resilient to diseases in this butterfly garden that will be good for those butterflies. So that is something to consider if you do have a pollinator garden. The caterpillar and webworm control also works, uh, if I haven't mentioned, on soft-bodied insects like white flies, aphids, um, all sorts of things. But I have noticed that it does not work on hard-bodied insects with the other ones that have the exoskeletons uh, like squash bugs, but I still spray it anyways on my during my regimen because those same plants also when the plant is being attacked by one insect the plant is weakened and therefore more insects will come and start attacking like aphids and white flies 
And that's another thing that I want to talk about is that when you have healthy plants, you're less likely to have pests and diseases on your plants. So how do you have healthy plants? And that is by giving them the nutrients that they need. You put down compost, you put down manure, you put down, you give them some fertilizer. And you do that in the spring. You might have to reapply that also halfway through the season, depending on whether your plants are heavy feeders or not. Like roses, for example, are very heavy feeders and they do need those nutrients so that they can stay healthy. Uh, and other plants like strawberries and such are also heavy feeders. They require a lot of feeding. So you want to give them those nutrients that they need so that they can stay healthy and combat those pests and diseases. And if you do have squash, you do have to stay on top of them, especially if you have, if, if one of those seasons you had a squash bug, then you know the next season you're going to have a lot more squash bugs. And you do have to stay on top of them to reduce that population because they will completely destroy your crop. And also same with vine borers that do attack squash plants. You just have to stay on top of them and you have to kind of do a preventative application uh, and not so much look for them and then attack them by, but because by the time you see them, it's too late. Now, when it comes to trees and shrubs, this is something that I use earlier in the season uh, before, like during the early, early spring or late winter, before anything has any leaves on it yet. I use this as a first application in combination with this one right here. So this right here is a copper fungicide and I have heard mixed reviews on this, whether it actually is good for us to ingest the plants that uh, we spray with copper fung fungicides or not. So I have to do some more research on this, but this one attacks, as it says, fungal diseases. And I spray this on our fruit trees and also I spray it on certain trees that do, that not, not necessarily fruit trees, but do suffer from fungal diseases and also on shrubs like roses, for example, because roses uh, tend to suffer from fungal diseases, especially if you live in a humid environment. So I only spray that early, early in the season before the plants put on any leaves and you have to follow the instruction on the whoa <laughs> you do have to you have to follow the instruction on the on the label right here on the back of the container and for this one you have to spray it, i believe when the buds are swollen but before the leaves do open because when the leaves are young and they do open this copper fungicide will actually fry them and can possibly kill your plant but this one right here, this is an all season uh, horticultural oil. And I do spray it earlier in the season, but I also spray it throughout the season. Not as much as I do with the neem oil and the Caterpillar um, Web and Warm Control, Web Warm Control. But I do spray it maybe, I would say maybe three times during the season or so, so maybe sometimes more especially on the roses. This works really great on the roses and also anything that's in the rose family, like for example, pears, apples, um, peaches, uh, apricots, cherries, basically all the trees that we have, plums, those are all in the rose family. And the rose family is very susceptible to fungal diseases and also to pests. And we have all those trees and shrubs over here. Uh, so this one works great also for fungal diseases and for pests and it's going to attack all pests so you do have to spray this early in the morning or later in the evening when all the insects are back to bed because you don't want to harm the pollinators especially if you are spraying this during the, uh, the growing season so uh, again read the label see how to use it before you use it. I have a couple trees, cherry trees that I want to uh, spray this on, but right now I still have some neem oil in here that um, I, I will be using next week. Uh, and then after that, I'll be spraying my cherry trees because it looks like there is something that's going on in there. I have been spraying them 
uh, every other week but uh, it looks like I do have to kind of uh, tackle them a little more because they seem to be more susceptible to pests and diseases more than the other trees that I have mentioned. Now fire blight is a big thing for pears and for apples uh, and that can kill your trees and this is why spraying something like this during the season will be very beneficial to them and also neem oil. If you are starting out and you don't have anything else other than neem oil, spray neem oil because that's going to help with the fungal diseases as well and it's going to combat fire blight. If you, especially if you live in a humid environment, you are more likely to get fire blight or if your plants are too close together, your trees are too close together and um, they don't have enough airflow or if you haven't pruned them properly, that can also, you know, pruning is a big thing. You have to allow airflow in your tree, in your fruit trees in order to, uh, for them to kind of to dry out and not kind of have this uh, congestion and for the humidity uh, can build up and then that is a great environment for fungal diseases to develop. Uh, so again, if these are the only two that you have or these, no, this one, oh, these right here, then uh, use that to combat fungal diseases and insects and this one to repel the pests like deer and mice and voles and rabbits and raccoons and all the things that you can think of. <laughs> so these, I would, if I was starting out, these are the two that I would start out with. And also this one, you don't have to apply it as much as the Bobex, so that is super easy. This one, as a preventative, you can spray every other week. So those are all the things that I use. I will be leaving links to all the things that I have mentioned here in the description box below. So if you are planning on getting any of these, check out the description box below. The description box is right under the video. There's a little down arrow. You click that and then you click on show more and you will see all these things in the description box. And I hope this video was helpful to you guys. I hope that um, you have learned something new from this. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section down below. And if you also have a solution for the voles and mice other than what I have mentioned over here, please also leave that in the comment section down below because I'm, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out. Like I said, I'm trying this mole max, mole max right here um, to see how it works out in the vegetable garden because I can't put that directly in the vegetable garden. Uh, I have another solution, but I don't think we can talk about that on YouTube. <laughs> So I hope you guys find this found this video helpful and if you like these types of videos hit that subscribe button and the bell to receive notifications of whenever I upload new videos. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again in the next video. Bye!